so before i jump to the topic uh, yeah this is where the code which i'm going to discuss is available so this is the short link uh, for you to uh, get to the code get to this url so you can make note of it and then if you want to try hands on you can just uh, fork it or download it and start working it's a i python notebook so this is how it looks this is in my github repository uh, i have created a repository called dask data frames 101 and it's a public repository you get to access the whole python file okay let's get into the webinar uh, so the idea here is dask is a, a python based framework to work on data frames uh, there is already a, another uh, framework called pandas ma library called pandas uh, that allows you to process data now what is this dask and uh, one second somebody seems to be waiting yeah joint yes so panda has already provides you the capability to process data that is in rows and columns that is in tabular format now what is this dask dask is another framework that allows you to process data whatever pandas does more or less or much more than what pandas gives it does uh, now why would we switch to dask that is the question uh, that begs an answer so i thought i will list down the reasons why should you use uh, uh, dask over pandas uh, that's the thought and I have been working in Dask for last six to eight months now, and uh, I enjoyed working. So whatever learning I got in last six to eight months, I thought I'll put it together and share it with the community. Uh, but there is much more to Dask than what we will discuss today. So uh, keep an eye for it, and then uh, you have enough materials uh, available on the web to expand your knowledge further. To start with, let's import the New York uh, uh, New York flights data set. I have already imported it, so I am not going to import it. If you want to import it, you can use this command, use this cell, execute this cell and then import it. So as a result, what do you get? You get a data folder. Inside the data folder, you have NYC flights and you have about 10 CSV files, one for each year. And each of them will be approximately 22, 23 GB, 23 MB, sorry, not GB. And uh, this data set is what we will be using today. So I hope that is clear. Uh, let's get back to the code. Uh, you can download the data set, it will download it for you. I'm importing the basic libraries. Uh, with respect to Dask, I'm importing uh, Dask data frame and uh, Dask delayed. That's with respect to uh, uh, Dask. Otherwise, Pandas, the usual stuff, and the general libraries for uh, manipulation, data manipulation. So let me execute this. So it, it shouldn't take much time. So first reason, first thing we will try read data into Pandas data frame. So how do we do that? Uh, I have 10 data frames, so I import 10 data frames separately and do a concatenation. That's all is happening in this line. So uh, that's how I have to do it. There's no way I can import all 10 data frames using one command. So it doesn't take time. It's very quick. So how much, uh, what is the uh, number of records in this pandas data frame? Is 2,611,892. So it's 2.6 million records. That's what we are processing. Uh, depending on the power of your laptop, the number of cores and the memory you have, things may be quicker, things may be slower. So watch out for that. Uh, it's 2.6 million records. Now, how do we check the sample records? We know how do we check the sample records, right? If we say uh, data frame, pandas data frame dot head will give you uh, sample records for all the columns. So we get an idea of what columns are there, what kind of values are there in each of the columns. And some places there will be NAN if there is no value, otherwise uh, uh, you have value there. 
that's something everybody is familiar with, I suppose. So that's Pandas data frame, right? Now, how do I read data frame into Dask? Dask data frame, uh, they have a very similar APIs. Okay, here it is pandas.readcsv. Here it is Dask data frame.readcsv. That's all. And the extra capability is it reads multiple CSV files in one command, provided the structure is same. So let's execute that. Uh, what has happened here? Now that I have uh, imported, I have read the CSV into a data frame called DDF, D meaning Dask, P meaning Pandas. So DDF and PDF are what we will use today. So I have a Dask data frame. If I have to look at the uh, records, if I say DDF, it will not show me all the records. What is happening here? The Dask data frames are by default lazily evaluated. Until you say get the data, it will not get the data. It will have only the pointer to the data. OK, so we'll come to this how to get data. But what works in uh, uh, Dask is you can say head. If you say head, it will go fetch top five records. This is very simple, right? This is similar to what Pandas is. But this particular data set is very uh, 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 tailor made to uh, demonstrate something called. If I say ddf.tail, I get an error message. So what's happening is out of the 2.6 million records, if you look at the uh, we know ddf.d types. So out of the 2.6 million records, it has sampled top 1000 records or so and identified what data type each of them are. OK, but uh, it would not have accounted for the all 2.6 million. In Pandas case, it will account for all 2.6 million. Let's do that in Pandas case also. PDF dot D types. So in this case, it would have accounted for all 2.6 million, understood what the data type is. In Dask's case, since it is lazy evaluation, it's not going to evaluate completely. It's going to take top 1000 records and uh, do the evaluation. That's why when the bottom records doesn't conform to the data type which it is, which it understood from the top 1000. Look at this. Uh, so expected uh, time, sorry, elapsed time uh, is expected as int 64 because in the top 1000 or so, it has integer values. But going down the line, in the bottom few records, there are float values. So it says uh, unexpected data type. Same thing happened for the tail number. Tail number also float is expected, but eventually object came. What an object is it could there could have been a space or an an and it is reading as object. So now this is one thing we'll have to live with it. So now I go and correct tail number should be string and elapsed time should be float and cancelled should be boolean. So I am reading it again. Now I read it. Now if I go and say tail, it would have worked. So basically the data for data type inference happens with the sample records, not the whole set of records. And that's one thing we should be aware of when we work on Dask data frames. Now, now that OK, uh, Dask data frame gives me, it doesn't look any different, right? Dask data frame and the Pandas data frame look exactly same. What difference does it make for the user? First difference is it has 10 different data sets. We, if you remember, we had uh, 10 different data sets. Here there are 10 different CSV files. Dask maintains, though it is all referred to in DDF, but it maintains them in 10 different partitions. So if you look at it, number of partitions, it maintains in 10 different partitions. So any operation happens in 10 small data sets rather than one big data set. Pandas reads all of them, concats into one data set. That's how we, we did it. If you remember, we did concat. We read each CSV file and concat it into one data frame. Now it is available as one data set, whereas Dask will maintain 10 different data sets under the same DDF pointer. So uh, so that what happens because we are maintaining it in 10 small data sets, operations will be quicker. That's the first advantage, first reason to switch to Dask from Pandas. 
now let's try some basic operations what are we trying uh, i have pandas data frame uh, and there is a day column called day of month but two day time will take only year month and day so i rename it to day and uh, i calculate the delay based on actual elapsed time and uh, 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 this is scheduled elapsed time and i square the delay and uh, arrival delay and departure delay i am i'm just doing five different operations in this case so this is how i do it in pandas how different is it in uh, dask it is not different only thing is data frame is different i'm using dask to date time pandas to date time let's see what happens here now if you see these are basic operations and uh, total time it took is 3 milliseconds in both the cases and uh, if you look at uh, dask executed in total 42 milliseconds pandas executed in 379 milliseconds <laughs> so and this is the uh, advantage you get because you are using dask uh, as we discussed it's all small data frames and then quicker results uh, and parallel processing also happens we will come to that this is the second reason in addition to this what you get in dask is a plan let's see uh, D data ddf is the uh, operation now let's visualize what all happened with ddf see it had 10 different uh, data frames 10 different read csv i'll open this image in a new tab okay see how many read csvs are there 10 different read csvs and all the operations happen wherever parallelization is needed it does parallelization and it brings together and it stores as 10 different results and the operations are so it is okay to store it as 10 different results so the operations are independent of each other only first and second are dependent and uh, all 10 can be stored separately that's the beauty this you don't get it in the pandas so where the parallelization happens there is a parallelization this is where two operations happens in parallel and then the uh, two get items and then subtract and one after the other the pipeline is visualized here and as i said uh, now what will happen okay somebody is waiting in the lobby so parallelization happens now that we executed this command it took only 42 milliseconds is it true now if i go and say ddf i don't get anything my ddf dot head will not give me all that now ddf dot head also will give me all that i think yeah it created all this uh, day column date column delay column date column and delay column are the two columns it created um, but uh, if you notice we calculate further more columns right date and delay and we have arrival delay and departure delay that is not yet done that's because there is an operation beyond the arithmetic so how to get all the operations going we have something called ddf dot compute now it will do all the calculations but still to okay it's here arrival delay and departure delay all of them are available so it took 1.84 seconds so compute is when your operations take place otherwise your operation doesn't take place okay it's a delayed it's a lazy execution that's something you have to bear in mind so any question so far because after this we are going to discuss uh slightly complex operations any question so far let's go to the next set of operations then we will yeah, talk about uh, arvin here yeah tell me arvin so the example uh, where you perform the few operations in that particular cell mm -hmm. so you are saying that is not executed until you type uh, what is that compute or execute yes uh, here it is executing that's what i noticed just now uh, data frames it's lazy evaluation always but uh, if we don't do compute it should not have calculated the 
uh, date delay, arrival delay and departure delay. It's happening here. Yeah. But in the next one, it won't happen. We but will arrival talk. delay and departure delay is already in the original data set. Because uh, if you look at the cell, you are okay, taking over that one, right? OK, let's me do this. Uh, this is a square. Yeah, I overwrote it. Uh, it has completed. It has computed in dust data frame. There is a way to delay it. We'll delay it. I will uh, go through this uh, read statements one more time so that uh, we see the outcome. This is the pandas data frame. I read it from the scratch. This is the ask data frame. I read it from the scratch. I do this. I do this. And we can visualize. And then we see what is there in DDF. In DDF, we have a date, delay, arrival delay square, and departure delay square. It does at the data frame level, it does. But uh, we'll see further down there's a delayed operation. If you want to delay all this, we can delay it. OK, sorry, that was my mistake. It does immediately. Data frame is a task uh, uh, collection. I was thinking it was not happening, but it's a news for me also. It is happening here. Uh, we will have a way to delay this. That I'll discuss further down. OK. So um, that's one thing uh, and uh, here we'll see this. Uh, let's say I want to take departure delay and calculate max. It gives me in 6.19 milliseconds, right? Or 7.92 milliseconds. All put together is 12 milliseconds here. Let's see here if I do this for an aggregation here. See here, here it doesn't give you any number. We have to give you compute to get the computations going. <coughs> so this is what I was expecting there, but it's not happening. Now if I give compute, you get 1435, the same answer. But if you notice here, it is uh, CPU times is total 7.92 milliseconds in the Pandas data frame. But in the Dask data frame, it is total is 3.8 milliseconds. Total executed in 12 milliseconds. Okay. I, OK, in this case, 16 milliseconds here. It's see you see it is 1.3 seconds. So uh, this is very effective when it comes to complex operations. And uh, there is a way to visualize this also. Any operation can be visualized. Any operation in DAS data frame can be visualized. Let's see how the visualization works here. So again, it maintains 10 different data frames. And then it brings it finds max at each data frame level and it reduces further. It finds the global max and then it provides the result. So the compute is must without compute. It is going to give a data type, but it is not going to give you the result. In this case, it gives you the result when we say compute. This is the pandas data frame. So the CPU time is 10 milliseconds here. Here it took uh, 3.8 seconds for some reason. But uh, here it is uh, very not very uh, uh, significant. I remember seeing significant difference, but uh, I must have misread. But uh, you see when things are getting more and more complicated, this will be very effective. So uh, this is the aggregate option operation uh, done on both uh, 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 Pandas data frame and Dask data frame. It is not uh, uh, command or API is not very different. Let's move quickly. And this is the key feature in Dask, a Dask delayed. Let's say we have a function. There are functions. Right, these are not Dask uh, data types, but uh, these are all just functions. Increment by one, in double the value, and add the uh, two values. What happens when we do uh, when we do all this? Uh, I execute all this uh, x and y first. Increment one by one. Increment two by one, and 
uh, add these two numbers. So what happens? Let me print x here. Let me print y here and then let me print z here. See then and there the values are uh, functions are executed then and there. Uh, as soon as increment one is called it executes as soon as increment two is called it executes and uh, when we call z it uh, takes both the results and gives me the final result. But if I want to do if I want to force a lazy execution until unless I say calculate z it should not evaluate e or x or y. So for that we need to uh, give a command dask delayed. Uh, this is a decorator uh, for each of the function. In this case, let's see what is there when after this print y and then print z. I wouldn't uh, run these two commands. Let's see what happens. So you get a delayed object, which means the function is not executed. Uh, it is just uh, a pipeline is getting created here. So now I will say z dot compute. Now we get five. So the main difference is if we give task delayed as a decorator, the function will not evaluate immediately. The function will get a delayed object which gets pipelined. In this case, let's see what the pipeline is. Huh? I will put z dot visualize. See here two increment operations that happens in parallel because one does not depend X does not depend on Y. Y does not depend on X. Two increment operations whereas Z depends on X and Y. So the add operation waits till two increment operations are done and the result is this pipeline is what is stored as a delayed object here. <laughs> and when we call compute the computations happen. This is the dask delay operation. Now let's see how to use this dask delay operation in data frame. So we saw the operations happening immediately here uh, for the data frame basic operations. Uh, all these operations happens in then and there and uh, we got the results in dask data frame. Uh, we wanted to see the values. We have to say head. That's all. Uh, we say, see the values. This five columns got created then and there. We did not give compute, whereas in the aggregate case we had to give compute. Uh, now, if for those uh, operations also we want to delay it, we can delay it. Uh, so, how do we delay the da uh, task delayed? How do we use the task delayed with data frames? So, I recreate the same data frame and uh, I created two functions. One is get date so that uh, I can use it uh, within the delayed object and get square. If these two functions were uh, available in line. If you notice here, I had uh, done those two operations in line. So the square operation happened in line like this. Date operation happened uh, to date time like this, right? So in task delayed, it is better we give we create uh, independent functions. And then uh, uh, decorate it with task delayed. So I, uh, the function takes a task series, converts the task series with whatever uh, transformation we wanted, and returns it. Now to tell you how task delay works. So I say task delayed. Uh, here I repartition the data into five, just for an uh, example sake. We noticed how task delayed works, right? Every function because uh, every function call does not gets evaluated immediately because there's a task delayed decorator. There are two ways to give the task delayed decorator. One is you can decorate it. Otherwise, you can call the function within the task delayed keyword. So function within a function. So I create a task delayed DDF repartition and uh, if you notice this, let's execute only this statement. What is this expected? The delayed object should not have executed like the one we saw then. So it, should, it will return a delayed object. Uh, it will not repartition now. Whenever we say compute, that is when the repartition will happen. 
So the here I have given a compute statement. That is when the repartition will happen. Otherwise repartition will not happen. So and I'm chaining the uh, delay object. I'll tell you how I'm chaining the delay object. So I take the data frame and repartition it and store the delayed object uh, in a variable called delayed object. Now I want to do four activities in parallel. One is take the delayed object. Create date from these three columns. Again take the delayed object. Create difference. And then take the delayed object of array delay and then get the square departure delay and get the square. So these four operations are independent of each other. So I create those in a temp delay object and temp delay object is a dictionary. So for each of them I give a column name and then I go to the main delay object. Main delay object and assign all this dictionary. So parallelly these four delay objects will get uh, assigned to the delay object and then delay object dot compute will take place. Uh, let's see how the whole thing looks like. OK, I have to execute this. I did not execute this. Now the functions are there. Now I do the computations. So it is done. So uh, now what is there in the A? See here A is no, I, it's not expecting me to uh, compute anymore. So it shows me the whole thing and it has calculated the four columns, four new columns and uh, the whole thing happened in three milliseconds. The compute operation itself happened in three milliseconds. Uh, earlier, how many milliseconds it was? It was same three milliseconds if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was five milliseconds. This keeps changing uh, depending on uh, your resource availability. Uh, so it took three milliseconds. Uh, the thing is, uh, we'll see the visualize and see what the outcome is. So let's see the task visualize date delayed object. Look at this. There is a uh, striking difference between this. Here also it did the same thing. Same operation. This is the delayed object. So 10 CSV files read. I repartitioned into five. So that happens now I have only five partitions and it takes all five partitions into one delayed object and it does all this functionalities in parallel and then it assigns and gives the result here. In this case, all 10 are maintained separately. You got 10 results at the end. You got 10 results at the end here. Since it's a delayed object, it considers as a one single object, but still it does multi processing. So parallel processing all that happens internally. So this is uh, this gives an idea of how efficient your process is. Pandas does not give you this. So that's about delayed object. Before we go to the next one, if any questions on delayed object, we can discuss that now. So you might not have noticed or I didn't prominently say that. So get date is a function which we executed here. Other places it says apply apply. So uh, get date is the function and two applies. Uh, that's happening in parallel. So uh, if you want to uh, you want to know the detail what the function is get square, you should call it like get date. Then uh, uh, you will get the get square here because from apply there is no enough information here. Get date very clearly says what it is. You want function name to appear here. You have to explicitly uh, call the get square like get date. Here get square is not explicitly called. It is applied for each row in the data frame. So any Thoughts on this uh, delayed object uh, we can discuss. Otherwise, we'll move. If you are executing in your system, it should work. Uh, let me know if you have challenges.
so it is a lazy evaluation even in the data frame without using delayed also but the lazy evaluation happens for the aggregates not for the basic operations that's the learning i thought it is for everything but uh, it not for the basic operations but for aggregates it does lazy evaluation that's more or less like delayed so assuming there are no questions uh, we'll move further so uh, here the functions get executed in parallel right now everything happens in this particular local machine now we wanted to do a distributed processing what do we mean by distributed processing uh, let's say you may have a cluster of uh, five machines you want to leverage the resources in all five machines to achieve the same objective that's what is distributed processing us here uh, we have to um, use the client dask distributed client and uh, when i say dask distributed client it is going to spin the client from the local local machine otherwise what you can do is if you have a cluster you can execute this you have to give the cluster details in this right now it takes a local cluster actually there is no difference between these three lines and these three lines it's going to use a local cluster by default uh, if you have cluster details give the cluster details here and then give the client of cluster it will start using the cluster in your at your end right now i am going to use only this so what is a client let's execute this it is going to spin a client for me in a url so if i go to this i get a dask uh, a client client tells me what is the status uh, how many bytes are stored uh, what is the task stream <laughs> etc etc what are the different tasks what are the system resources how are they looking at so we will we will view this in parallel okay sorry all i do this i should say tile window to right screen okay now we have this client with us client is basically our multiple uh, systems uh, i will go start to the status screen okay now i have a client i will read the file from the scratch so that i got the original file i have this functions here there is no need of a dask delayed what happens is why we don't need dask delayed is we are going to submit the job to the client client will run all this in the background and give us the results so it's not going to bother us uh, let's see i have got this basic functions get date get square get difference and uh, add columns to the main data frame this is what the functions are let's read this one by one okay let me client restart if you want to restart i'm not restarting it now i am taking this and executing separately what is this doing is client dot map or submit doesn't matter here map is if you are giving multiple inputs so i give map here and uh, if i give only one input i have to give submit here my for multiple inputs it's going to spin multiple Uh, processes so it still i'm giving it within a list henceforth i'm using a map i'm sending a data frame with this three columns and expecting date to be available in a that's all i'm expecting so let's see what am i uh, at the end of a what at the end of execution let's see what it does so you notice this so if we set client dot map give the function and a returns a future object saying pending now the job is running in the background how do i know uh, if a is complete if i give a it will say future is finished if there is a error in the statement it will give error here and uh, for every future task you get a key here and you can use this key to check the status but uh, otherwise if you give this also you'll get the status the result is a series and uh, you notice the key is same now how do i see the result uh, that is uh, client dot gather uh, one second i forgot the thing client dot gather
Okay. Yeah. So client dot gather a gives me uh, uh, 10 partitioned uh, data task series. It still is uh, this thing, right? So a dot result. Results. Sorry, one second. Uh, result is a function. Yeah, a dot result is a function. Um, a dot result head. <laughs> OK, it's a list. OK. A is a future object. Uh, I thought it is client dot gather. Client dot gather dot result. Now it's a list. It says uh, how. Okay, I'm sorry. You are I have to give zero. I'll tell you why. It's a now if I say result. One second. Ah, it gives me this. So client dot gather. Uh, I wanted to see the result. Yes, so client dot gather. This is the converted dates. So uh, why we give uh, a of zero? Because if you notice here, we are passing a list. List can have more than one values. So which means it, this is a also a list. So for the first input, what the output is. So that's what it is. So it returns me this. Uh, so the basically what we want to understand is what is a a is a future object as soon as you execute a you will return as a pending uh, basically it's getting executed once the execution is complete it will give me a status called complete otherwise how there is another way to check is okay a dot underscore state R dot okay for client dot submit only it works like that not for client dot map. Let me see client dot submit. Sorry guys. No, uh, something else is going wrong. So let's uh, live with client dot map. It gives a finished object. Okay, sometimes it very quickly it finishes and I get uh, finished object then for client dot gather a of zero head gives me this. Uh, otherwise it gives me only the basic structure or compute would also give me this. Compute will give me the whole set of things. Since I'm not giving submit it is expecting me to give the compute. So for each of this I'm saying uh, get date get difference between these two values get square get uh, square again for a different column. Now I am passing all of this data frame followed by all the four future objects to the function and uh, get back the uh, result in a variable called merge and let's see what this does. So it has changed everything and it has given the status as pending and uh, merge. Now it is finished. And I go and say merge dot result dot head and uh, all the four new columns new 0 1 new 0 2 new new 0 new 1 new 2 new 3 all the columns are available for me uh, from the server. And another thing I did not uh, explain is uh, the how to see the dashboard. OK. OK, the dashboard has a lot of uh, this thing. So let's say task manager kind of. No, this is not the task system related details. Um, 
let me execute this uh, uh, and see if what the changes in the so there is a sudden peak in processing the bytes per second and i get it here there is not much happening from this screen not much is visible but there are examples in the web which will tell you okay i'll restart the client one more time to show you the okay that is right now nothing there let's go and execute the merge you will see the changes here so all the operations uh, it is quick so you don't get to see many things many movements here it's very small operation it completes it very quickly and uh, yeah you have it and ddf is not disturbed if uh, the reason i got is only in the merge we have this four columns ddf is not disturbed now uh, we have this uh, client what more can be done let me do a client dot restart once. Should uh, clean things up for me. Yeah, it clean things up for me. Uh, if you remember, we had a delayed object. We can also submit the delayed object via a function and then get the results back. So I get this delayed object. I use the client. So the the, the request goes to the server, basically clusters. So a lot of operations happen here and henceforth uh, you see a lot of movement there. Now the delayed object is executed in the cluster uh, because we give client.submit. Now for, for the client.submit, we get to see what is the R dot state. Or uh, if I have to say R here, OK, it's finished. It says I should go restart the client. It won't say finished immediately. Yeah, I restarted the client. Now I go and say it will give me pending. It gives me pending. It will give me pending, pending, finished. So the moment job is done, it is finished. How do I see the result? I see the result by giving R dot result and all the four columns delay date array uh, arrival delay square and departure delay square all four are there <coughs> so uh, that's how you execute a task uh, commands uh, task data frame related commands in the cluster so these are the things and for reference i have given some uh, references two YouTube videos and one coders column video. Uh, you get to uh, especially the other YouTube video. One of the YouTube video generates uh, about uh, some GBs of data so that you get to see enough movements in the dashboard here. That will be useful. So this is the uh, is what I thought I'll uh, present today. Uh, yeah. We can discuss any questions with whatever my little knowledge in last six to eight months, I can try answering your questions. Yeah, this is Arvind again. Mm -hmm. You yes, had uh, earlier 10 partitions and then you repartitioned to five. Yes. And then the visualization shows, you know, things happening in parallel. Yes. But uh, suppose your local system has only, let's say, four cores. Mm -hmm. This is not giving the complete picture. No. How do we find the actual parallelization that happens? Because if you have only four cores, then we will not have these 10 partitions or five partitions running in parallel. It has all that it says is it has partitioned the data and it will parallelize as much as possible with the available resources. How it internally works is uh, you will have to figure out you through your task manager. 
I am not sure if let's say I have only four cores, but I have given 40 partitions. Uh, what kind of parallelization? What is the mechanism behind it? Uh, I'm not sure. So the visualization uh, method, it's not uh, giving the actual parallelization finally. It's an execution plan. It's not yeah. a parallelization per se. You will have to uh, see using your uh, dashboard or your task manager. It's an execution plan. That's how the execution partition may partition execution happens. What I get to understand is one core itself can do a lot of tasks at parallel. But uh, I haven't uh, really gone to an, that extent how it is internally processing. So anybody else? Any other questions, thoughts? So if no questions, I just want to share uh, one particular thing which is relevant <laughs> to this topic. Sure, sure, uh, Arvind. Share my screen for this purpose. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. So on Devopedia, we have an article titled Optimizing Pandas. And uh, if you go down, uh, there is a particular uh, question which asks which third party libraries help improve, improve Pandas performance. So here, uh, you know, this is picked up from a paper or a blog. Yeah. So this uh, image gives you some sort of an idea, like uh, what is the standard practice in the industry? If your data set is less than one GB, it is not big enough for you to adopt any kind of uh, higher level frameworks like Task or PySpark, you know? So they said if Pandas is good enough. So that may be the reason why, you know, in our example, uh, we were dealing with only 22 MB uh, times 10. So 220 MB, which is far less than 1 GB. So Pandas is doing it efficiently. Whereas if you go to task for a smaller data set, it has to do extra housekeeping and stuff like that, which makes it actually slower than Pandas. But if you're talking about really large data sets like 1 GB to 100 GB, that is where a task will shine when compared to Pandas, which we don't see in our example because our data set was small. So this is my interpretation and this is what the people in the industry also have written about. So if you're dealing with the large data sets, 1 GB to 100 GB, then you know you can use Dask or Pandas chunk size or PySpark, any one of these. But what if you are talking about really large data sets, maybe in the range of uh, terabytes and petabytes, then the solution is PySpark. So this is what uh, in industry people are saying. There are many other uh, alternatives to tasks like uh, multiprocessing, modeling, uh, modern array, Swifter, and so on. Uh, of course, this is only a high level view uh, of what uh, you can do to optimize pandas. Uh, what uh, Ramanathan has shared is a more uh, useful and hands on uh, introduction to task. So just take a look at this article if, for those who want to know more optimizing pandas. So that's all I have to share from my side. Yeah, compared to Spark, if you're familiar with the Pandas data frame, Dask should be your choice. Uh, or uh, Spark also, PySpark also uses uh, Python, but uh, you will have to learn the Spark uh, APIs, basically RDDs and uh, uh, it has its own uh, data frames. Uh, without if you have, if you are already an expert in python you can stick to dask or uh, pyspark is there hmm. 
Okay. Uh, that's good. If, uh, if people don't have questions, then we can also close, right? Arvind? Yeah, thanks for joining. Yeah. Thanks for joining our event. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. See you next event. Yeah.